Welcome to the Rockbrook Church Podcast. Our hope is that today's message brings you hope and clarity for your spiritual journey. We love hearing how God is working in your life. Feel free to share any stories of how this message gave you a new perspective and hope. Email us at church at rockbrook.org to tell your story. Glory to God. Come on, you can do better than that. Amazing. Glory to God. Love being a part of a church who serves, a church who cares. At Rockbrook, we believe uh, that all of what we know amounts to nothing if we don't use it to love Christ and to serve other people. I want you to know that what you saw represented in that video, of course, is an amazing day, an amazing weekend, uh, serve day weekend, but some of those things uh, actually go on monthly to a degree or other partnerships with an organization or ministry to young mothers or the abused or distributing food or uh, ministering to children, missionaries and uh, people that uh, we get to be continually generous with. Some of the small group projects uh, are relationships that uh, groups have ongoing uh, with uh, that partnership or that organization or those people. And uh, Maybe you're even here today because someone invited you on Serve Day weekend last weekend. If so, we're so glad you're here. I love hearing stories of people lifted up or seen or cared for by our church. So praise God and thank you. Thank you for serving. Thank you uh, for being bold enough to make a difference in Jesus' name. My name is Ryland and it's an honor to bring the message today. I'm going to start with something I've done with you before. It's kind of one of my Easter traditions, I guess. I'm going to show you some pictures on the screen of some empty things. You just tell me whether they're good or bad. Uh, An empty wallet, is that good or bad? Uh, How about an empty gas tank, is that good or bad? Uh, How about empty refrigerator, is that good or bad? How about, uh, oh, this is too bad, an Easter, uh, empty Easter egg, that's bad. How about, uh, I saw this online at an In-N-Out burger store, out of hamburger meat. That's too bad, right? But here's the last one. Is this good or bad? Come on, somebody. This is good. It's so good. And I want you to know what we've sung about Jesus today and what we're preaching on Jesus today is not just a metaphor. It's not a philosophy. It's not just this picture of idea of like, oh, springtime and eggs and new life. No, we believe if you're taking notes, you might write this in, that the resurrection is real. And that's what Christians have believed since the resurrection, that a real body really got up out of that tomb. And Christianity is stubbornly historical to this fact. The truth of the resurrection is as real of an event as all events in human history. Jesus was on earth in his resurrected body for uh, 40 days after the resurrection. More than 500 people saw him in 10 post-resurrection events, appearances. And this Easter, uh, we're beginning a series uh, talking about different encounters people had with Jesus before and after the resurrection. And this week, we're going to look at one of the most notorious doubters who ever lived, because for 2,000 years, come on somebody, we've been calling him Doubting, and maybe you've heard that before, you didn't even realize that was from Christianity. Uh, But let's look at it today. This is in the book of John in the New Testament. Uh, The Bible is made up of several different books, and the books sometimes are named after the person who wrote it, or they're named after the person who it was written to. Uh, This one is is named after the disciple of Jesus named John, who wrote a biography of Jesus, and it's broken up in chapters and verses. So this is John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. Look at it with me. This is uh, on the evening of Easter Sunday, the the Sunday that Jesus resurrected, of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, known as Didymus, one of the twelve, 
was not with the disciples when Jesus came. And I'm sorry, but I just think that's funny. I don't know what he was doing out getting Starbucks for the group or something, but he was, missed the biggest event in human history. Do you ever have a friend, do you have a friend who's like, they always have to get up and go to the bathroom at the most important part of the movie, or like they walk in halfway to everything and they always miss it. And reminds, a few years ago when uh, the Chiefs were in the playoffs, uh, they were playing the Texans, and this is really when the run started getting going, but it, it's been you know, a rough, rough streak leading up to that. And the Texans are up 21 to zero. And my wife says, I'm just gonna go put the boys to bed. And she goes, puts them down for a nap, takes a long time. She comes out, Chiefs are up like 40 some odd points. She's like, wow, what happened? Then a few weeks later, we're in the Super Bowl. It's rough playing the 49ers, we're down not looking good. She's like, I'm just going to put the boys to bed. She puts the boys to bed, comes back out. We're winning the Super Bowl. She's like, wow, what happened? And so now whenever the Chiefs are down, I'm thinking, maybe Lauren ought to go put the boys to bed and let's see what happens, right? And she missed it all. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. They tell him what happened. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, this speaks to the severity of the crucifixion, that Jesus thoroughly died on the cross. Thomas is saying, you're telling me that the guy who I watched hang on that cross, crucified, suffocate to death, bleed out, was standing here among you, I won't believe that until I see it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. John goes on to say, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing, you may have life in his name. He says, you know what, I've got far more sources. I have far more memories of what Jesus did than I've put in. He's very selective, but he chooses this moment with Thomas as the climactic moment of the Gospels. Why? What's so special about Thomas? I mean, yeah, he'll go on. He's got one more chapter to his biography of Jesus where he ties up some loose ends between Peter and Jesus and some other things. But why, what's so special about this moment that it's the climax? It's one question I had this week while studying this encounter. The other I had is, why does Jesus contradict himself here? Like, he, if you watch, he says one thing, but then he does another. He says, you know what, Thomas, people don't need this. They don't need to see me physically to believe that I rose. You could have just believed the other disciples, but then he shows them. And then I, I caught myself kind of doing the same thing this week. Of, I rebuked my kids. I'm like, you don't need to eat so many chips. Why are you always asking for chips? And I said, go ahead, have some chips. It's fine, right? Like I said one thing and then I'll, I'll let him do another. And when you ask these questions, what you begin to see is that Thomas has been chosen as the climax of the gospel, not because he's a great doubter, but because he's a great apostle. The term apostle, just an extra note for you here, is uh, it's a Bible word, and it means one who is sent. And the re remaining 11 disciples, so Jesus called 12 disciples, Judas betrayed Jesus, took his own life. There are 11 remaining. And those remaining disciples work on behalf, begin their work on behalf of the church. And the apostles' witness and teaching form the foundation of the truth of our faith. And the apostles had a special task of the founding of the church. 
Now we'll get this, what, what this has to do with you and me in a moment. We'll get there, but just track with me here for a moment. The reason that the disciple Thomas needs to see Christ physically is not in order for him to be a believer. As a believer, Thomas does not need to see the risen Christ with his own eyes. But as an apostle, he does. And that first meeting that Thomas missed, wherein he's gone, that's the first commissioning of the apostles. And Jesus gives them the message. He says, Here's the, it's, I'm giving you the authority to tell people how to be forgiven. And the reason Jesus needs to make sure Thomas is included is because the apostles were eyewitnesses to the resurrection. Later, when they go to elect a new apostle, they say it's got to be someone who's a witness with us to the resurrection of Jesus. Later, the apostle Paul says, I've seen the risen Lord. If I hadn't seen him, I couldn't be an apostle. And when it comes to the resurrection, the apostles get the royal treatment. They get every kind of possible proof. They get rational proof, physical proof, existential proof, they got everything. They're overwhelmed with it. So, when the apostles and their associates begin to die off, their witness and their teachings put into this book, the Holy Bible. So how can you, 2,000 years later, be sure that Jesus rose from the dead and believe it? You look at what John and Thomas said And they say, look at the treatment we got. Look at not what we chose to believe. They say, look at what we saw with our own eyes. But guess what? For one week, Thomas had to relate to the apostles the same way you and I have to relate to them today. And Thomas is rebuked for not believing their testimony. So how are we doing? How about me? How about you? Are you believing the apostles? You see, just one more thing before we get to your notes. Thomas already knew plenty about the teachings of Jesus. If Thomas' job as an apostle was to be sent out to say what Jesus said, he was thoroughly equipped and qualified to do so. But of what's of most importance is not just what Jesus said, but what he did. Because Christianity is not just a religion to follow. What he did for you has power to save you. Not a philosophy, but what actually happened in history. So the apostles don't just bring his teaching to you so that you can make it all about you. He brings what Jesus did because it's all about him. And that's the reason why it changed the world. Thomas was a great apostle, and he became a great believer. In fact, he was the first to evangelize the nation of India. Believing Thomas took the gospel farther geographically than any other apostle. People from another religion captured him and threatened him. They said they'd kill him if he didn't deny Jesus. And he said, I could never deny what I saw, the risen Christ. And they killed him. And he was killed for not just what he believed, but killed for what he saw. And this amazing moment of Thomas seeing Jesus is the climax of the gospel. So what does it have to do with you and me this Easter? Well, there's a lot of instruction here of how to build your belief, of how to become a believer. It answers the question, do you know why some of you are worried about life right now? Like you're worried You're worried to death. You're worried about death. Uh, You're worried about money. You're bitter right now. Like as you sit there right now, you are bitter against somebody else. Maybe angry at someone. Maybe you've tossed and turned all week because uh, you felt like you were left out or, or snubbed or ignored by somebody. The reason that you may be worried today or you may be discouraged today or you may be angry today is because you don't really believe Jesus is who he says he is. Because when you believe in Jesus, when you build your belief in Jesus, there's a blessing that comes with it. 
There's a blessing of peace. There's a blessing of your worries being dispelled. So you say, well, how do I strengthen my belief in Jesus? Well, you do the same things that Thomas did. This is very practical. Let's look at these quickly uh, together. If you're taking notes, the first thing you do to build belief is you listen to the apostles. They were telling Thomas. In fact, this word told right here, look at this word told. Uh, that word, that it's actually a verb of they kept on telling him. And Jesus shows up and rebukes Thomas for not listening to them. Listen now, if you want Jesus to become very real to you, the most important thing you can do is actually go read the accounts of the apostles in the New Testament and watch Jesus in the Gospels, talking to people, healing people, eating with people. And you've got to see him that way. That's why we're starting this series. That's why I invite you to come back and hear more of the apostles' accounts of Jesus dealing with people. No matter your doubts about Christianity, if you listen to the apostles, Jesus will become real to you. Number two, see how patient Christ has been with you. So Thomas said, well, I won't believe it until I see it. How did Jesus know Thomas said that? Did, did he have like a resurrection appearance on Wednesday? And the disciples were like, hey, Jesus, let me tell you what Thomas said about you. And Jesus was like, oh, really? Well, let me show Thomas. No, no, no. Thomas realizes that Jesus has been listening. That he's been there all along. That Jesus knew Thomas. Seen all his doubts. Seen all his fears. Had been right there. And yet, here he is before Thomas. And guess what? Jesus knows all the stupid things you've ever said. And all the stupid things you and I have ever done. And he knows all the promises that you make to yourself and don't keep. And all the promises that you make to other people and haven't been able to keep. And all the promises that you make to God and haven't been able to keep. He knows all your flaws. He knows all your sins. And yet he shows up and says, I'm here for you. And I love you. And I'm going to be here for you. And you've got to see that he's been with you all along and he's been patiently, intelligently loving you in spite of all the sin and all the things that we've done and all the broken promises. So how do you build your belief? You listen to the apostles. You see how patient Christ has been with you. Number three, you look at his wounds. You might write that in. To see how great the love of God is. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. By his wounds we are healed. Humanity did not need just another system to put in place, another set of rules to follow. We didn't, we could not get right with God. We couldn't do it. And we needed someone, a savior, to come live the life we could not live, to die in our place on the cross, to rise from the dead, to give us new life. A God with wounds to say it's done, a way's been made. Believe in me and you will be saved. You see, our sin broke our connection with God. And you feel it like so something is not right. Something is dead. And when sin entered the world, death entered the world. Before there was no sin, or before there was sin, there was no death. But there was a fall, the fall of mankind. And with it came separation from life and separation from God that we could not mend. And life is now broken, the world is broken, relationships are broken, you've experienced it. But you were made to last forever. And will you last forever in death or in life? And God says, I want you to have eternal life. And the wounds of Jesus, the wounds of Jesus show us that there is something to be saved from. And God cared enough to save you from it. And so you look at his wounds. Number four, you drop your conditions. <laughs> Thomas had demanded something. Uh, he demanded a condition. And almost everybody, by the way, almost everybody comes to Christ this way. Uh, they say, well, Lord, I'll, I'll um, man, if you let this relationship work out, I'll believe in you. 
Lord, if you let uh, this business thing or this career or whatever, if you let this work out, God, if you'll heal my kid, if, you, if you'll turn my kid around, I'll believe in you. God, if, if you just get me through this semester, I'll believe in you. And all the teachers said, God, if you just get me through this semester, I'll believe in you. But if you ever have a condition to believing in Jesus, do you realize what you've done? If you ever say, God, if you fill in the blank, X, God, I'll obey you if X happens, then X is your real Savior. X is your real Lord and God. X is the thing that you're really after. And I can tell you one thing, whatever you fill in the blank there, X, will never die for you. But it will demand that you die for it. And you might be sitting in church still doubting because you've never dropped your condition and say, Lord, I'll, I'll believe you. I'll obey you because you are Lord. And when you've done that, you've stopped doubting and you've believed and you're ready. Jesus shows up to Thomas, says, behold, see my wounds. And he just responds. He doesn't, he doesn't reach out and touch him. He drops his con- condition and just gives his confession. And that's the fifth thing that we do to build our belief, is renew your confession of belief. You might write that in. Because belief is not just what you think, it's what you say, it's what you do. It's how you express it. Thomas gives one of the greatest confessions of faith in all the Bible. He renews his belief. Confess, by the way, is a very positive word. I know we normally think of that word as like confessing to something bad in a police station or something like that. But confess actually just means to agree. So you align with God and you declare it. You admit it. And each word of Thomas's confession is important. Uh, he says, my, this is personal. He says, you're my Lord. My. This is not just what other people think. Not just what the other disciples thought. He said, Lord, this is, this is what I think. He says, you're my Lord. Now, Lord means ruler or sovereign. Uh, it's a very countercultural word, especially in first century. Because Romans would say Caesar is Lord. And they worshipped Caesar as God. Became a test of loyalty in the Roman Empire. When Christians refused to say Caesar is Lord, and they would say Jesus is Lord, They'd be put down in their communities. They'd be outcast. Many of them put to death, thrown to lions, impaled on poles, made to go fight gladiators. Many of them lost their lives simply because of one phrase, Jesus is Lord. But he makes it personal. He says, you're my Lord. That means you're the director of my my life. But he doesn't stop there. He says, you're my God. God means that you're the creator and owner of, of all things, but he makes it personal again. You're my creator, Lord. The Bible tells us the confessions are important, that we could all come together and admire Jesus today. That would not build our belief. You have to acknowledge it. You have to confess your belief, to say to him, you're my Lord, you're my God. So you listen to the apostles. You see how patient he's been with you. You look at his wounds. You drop your conditions. You renew your confession of belief. And number six, you receive his blessing. The result of belief is blessing. People who live a life of faith live a life of blessing. Now what does that mean? Blessing is the satisfaction, the fulfillment of life. It's what every single one of us are looking for. And it's found through believing in Jesus. It's found through being connected to Jesus Christ. Some people attach this word blessing to uh, material things or like a circumstance working out the way that they, they prayed that it would. And of course, sometimes that, that's a, a thing of blessing. But that's just a, that's a very shallow form of blessedness, if that's all you're looking for. True blessing, I'll say it this way, it's living with promise. 
True blessedness of life is living with promise. It's knowing that, come on, like all those things I showed before, you say, that's me today, like empty wallet, empty refrigerator, empty gas tank. But my life is full because I'm living with promise. It's saying, I may be, even though I'm poor in spirit, God is meeting the needs of my life. And even though I may be mourning or grieving, he's there with me and he's comforting me and he's strengthening me and I'm never alone. This blessing, living with promise, is that even though everyone around me is freaking out, I'm not afraid. Because I have a promise and there's a peace, and there's a strength. And that as we look forward to heaven, we can have a promised life on earth. Listen now, not a perfect life on earth. A promised life. You'll still have problems, but there is peace. John 20, 29, again, Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are the ones who have not seen and yet have believed. And we would not have this promise except for Thomas's confession. And I'm so glad he confessed his belief and I'm so glad he saw Jesus so that we could have a rock solid foundation to build our life on. And then we could live with promise. Would you pray with me please? Maybe it's been some time since you just sat still before the Lord and believed him. And just sat there and trusted um, him with your life, received his blessing. Maybe it's been, been a while since you experienced the love of Christ expel the fear in your life. I want you to know that even before the world was made, God knew you'd be sitting there wrestling with what you're wrestling with, trying desperately to believe in Jesus. And he comes to you today and he says, I, I've, I'm here for you. And that my love can meet you today. And he says, I can save you. You can build your belief on me. Jesus, thank you for giving us your word, giving us your promises. We believe you. You are the Lord. And we renew our confession that you're not just a Lord, you're not just a God. You are my Lord. You are my God. Be my director. As much as I know how right now, I'm trusting in you. I believe in you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We would love for you to get connected to what's going on at Rockbrook. Visit us online at rockbrook.org for service times, small group information, and other ways you can discover your purpose here on earth.